Okay, hi there. Um, I, I think you all know who I am, but I'm Tracy Larrabee. I'm a professor of computer science and engineering. I'm also the associate dean here. I'm among the people that called in by the, get called in by the provost to help them understand some of the engineering academic integrity cases. Uh, I talk to a lot of students who feel they've been treated unfairly. I also talk to a lot of students who are remorseful and want to know how to move forward. And the thing that people have the most emotion around is being caught with plagiarism. Among other things, uh, there's more cheating cases reported from engineering than any other division on campus. I think that's because we have these programmatic methods for detecting um, cheating. And so I want to make sure you all understand how code comparators work. Well, what we use is, uh, in a lot of our classes, is MOS, which is a measure of software similarity. It comes out of Stanford. And it's an automatic system for determining the, determining the similarity of programs. And people use it in programming classes, but it's not the only system. For example, if you've been in one of Nargis Neruzzi's classes and you've used Stepic, Stepic has its own code comparator built into it. It isn't MOS, but it works like MOS. So if you know about MOS, you know about how other systems work. Uh, MOS, um, MOS works better as far as a lot of CSE professors are concerned than some of the previous things. It's pretty user friendly if you are comfortable with Git and you're comfortable with the code that is being used. So what MOS is not is it's not infallible. It's not um, a system for completely automatically detecting plagiarism. It always takes a human being because there are, there are actually reasons why your code would look like someone else's that do not constitute cheating. And one of the things I want you to understand is that if a, an instructor asks you to come in and talk about possible academic misconduct, that's not the end of the road. There's a conversation you get to have with the instructor. There's a conversation you get to have with your provost. It's quite possible. I have seen multiple cases of charges being dismissed once the student told their story. And sometimes it happens immediately when they talk to the instructor. Sometimes it happens after they talk to the provost and the provost says, now wait a minute, how come this student is going through this? And then the provost will actually contact the instructor and talk about it more. So just because you get an email saying, can you come in and talk about something, doesn't mean the story's over. So don't give up. You need a human driver. And um, if we have an instructor who is issuing um, cheating charges solely based on a MOS or a STEPIC report, that would be bad. And we would want to hear about that and make sure that instructors are hand checking for things. Um, so what's in MOS? Well, first of all, it doesn't matter whether you have tabs or white spaces. Uh, it doesn't matter whether this, your, the procedure is at the top of the code for one, um, one pair of students who, are, who were, have similar code and at the bottom for the other. It doesn't matter um, what your comments are. It doesn't matter if you change variable names. It has to do with the parsing of the program into machine code, uh, which is to say you have to know a hell of a lot to beat MOS. That is to say, one of the things that the people who teach the programming classes here and I, and I will be one of those people next year because I'll be teaching a programming class next year, um, believe is that in order to know enough to copy code and not get caught by MOS is way harder than just not copying the code. That is to say, um, it, it'd be way better to just learn how to do stuff. Um, here is a little bit about what MOS looks like. So um, this is, you can see that this student has a 97% match with that student. Now, one of the things that happens, I don't see it on the list, but some, oh, here you can see. This student has a match of 76%, and that student has a match of 77%. This is the percentage of this student's code that matched the other student's code. So you can have things in your file that, are, that don't match, and so your percentage number will be different. You can have identical code in two different files and have only a 40% match for one student and a 75% match for the other. It depends upon the other stuff that's in the file. Now, um, I want to open this and get it to my second screen. So here is a MOS report. So 
you can see in this Moss report, um, you can go through and it will take you to exactly the places that match. And this only has one block of code that matches, but oftentimes you'll see lots of different blocks of code and they, they, they cycle through colors. So after red comes blue and then comes purple and then comes aqua or whatever, and then it goes back to red. So when you see a lot of different colors in a MOSS report, and by the way, I know instructors aren't listening, but it's so much easier to deal with MOSS reports when they're in color. I absolutely hate it when professors photocopy stuff and then all I can look at is a fuzzy black and white copy of what I know is an interactive, colorful display. That's very disturbing. Now, this particular code sample was given to me. And by the way, all of this is anonymized. You'll see student 00, student 01. Um, there's no, these are real actual code samples, but they have been changed so that no one, um, there'd be no way to figure out which student's name is associated with which cheating sample. But so these, you can see it starts out and it looks really similar. But if you, if you, if you scroll down, a lot, you can see areas where it looks remarkably different. And um, one of the messages that the people who teach programming want to get across to you is that it will, for example, suppose you have an if loop, you have a while loop in one and it's a for loop in another, the, the code comparator will figure that out. Changing variables does not help you. Adding comments does not help you. Um, Changing the order of your code does not help you. Even if you take a procedure and break it into two pieces, doesn't help you. So for you to know enough to know how to trick MOS, which by the way is possible, is probably harder than just knowing how to program the code. Now, one of the things that I want you to understand is that if you're not doing the work to learn to program, if you see one example of how to do things, it causes your mind to just kind of zero in and think that's the only way to solve it. And that means that your code is going to look exactly like someone else. The metaphor that I got in speaking with a literature professor is, suppose you were talking to people who'd never done any creative writing at all. And it, you gave everybody an in-class writing exam. You say, you're going to have to write an in-class writing exam. And before you do it, I want to show you what a romantic scene would be. And then you show one of the mini cinematic versions of the balcony scene from Romeo and Juliet. And now you say, I want, now I want you all to write a romantic scene. Well, if you've never thought about romantic scenes before, the probability that you'd be talking about the light from the moon on the balcony and uh, a rose by any other name would smell as sweet is very high. That is to say, if you only have one, only seen one instance of a thing, then you don't even know that it looks like copying when you duplicate the only instance of the thing that you've seen. Um, so I, I, I know that sometimes people don't know they're cheating, but I have yet to run into a situation where the student didn't know that they weren't putting enough effort into mastering the materials of the class, uh, which is a slightly different thing. And now I want to close that so I can go back to my slides. Uh, next. Um, MOS is only the first step. So once MOS has indicated cheating results, then we have to look at it. Um, and there's a bunch of visualizations they use that can really change exactly what argument you might have about how this is reasonable. So for example, this, is a, this was from a class with about 150 students. And each one of these little circles is, it says student 001 or student 003. So once again, anonymized. But you can see there aren't that many names. So this was a real programming assignment, 150 students did the programming assignment, and these are the only students for which Moss had anything to say. Like there was not that there was, there wasn't even 1% code match for all the names that don't appear on there. Now that's a little bit hard to say. This is on number of lines that matched, and the next we have percentage of code that matched, and here we have darker lines that show a larger percentage of code. So if you, if you would have a little tiny light line if you only had one line of code in common with another student, and a really thick line if you had a larger percentage. So now, if we, if we take it past a threshold, so 
professors have the ability to say, hey, Moss, only tell me about students who have more than 60% code match with another student. So this is the same graph for a percentage is, and now it's been reduced to only students that are over a certain threshold. Now here you can see, it looks like it's possible the students over there on the far right might have collaborated, but there aren't that many lines in common. I mean, looking at how, how thick the lines are. Those three students look like something going on. We gotta check into that. Those two, those two, and here's something bigger going on. First of all, there might be two separate situations. Uh, it might be one situation. This kind of thing that you're looking at there, if the students come in and they say, but wait a minute, my MSI tutor helped me. My MS, that code that you're saying I copied, that was on the whiteboard during my MSI tutor session. And your professors might buy that with a graph like this. Sometimes students say, hey, I didn't cheat. All I did was go to MSI. And yet they only matched with one other person when there were 20 people at MSI. So the professor's not going to take that excuse seriously. Because if it was something about the TA or the way the class was taught, then it should be a larger graph and not a smaller graph. Um, so I just wanted you to see that. And here's basically the same thing, only it's number of lines connected. Once again, you can see there's three small groups and then one big group that has two sort of connected components. And this will inform, this kind of graph informs the way the instructor interacts with you in terms of what they think might have happened. Um, and, but, and then here we have all the students in the class and for a particular assignment, what percentage of code lines matched with anyone else. And once again, the student, the professor will probably pick a threshold of what they're going to pay attention to. So for example, everybody below here, we're just not even going to investigate, they get a pass. And everybody up there, of way, way high on the, on the really vertical part, those are the ones that they're going to have to look at by hand. And realize if the instructor's trying to minimize their work, they're actually going to want to look at fewer cases, and that would cause them to look higher on the graph. So for example, I should be using my nice colors. This particular student that I showed you their code, they matched an incredibly high number of lines with other students, and they're way up at the tail of the graph right there. And I've had students claim that the professors were out to get them. I had one student show up into my office with his lawyer father talking about how they were going to sue our asses off because they were ruining this kid's life when they were supposed to write it. Let's say that the student's name is Noah. It wasn't Noah, but let's have it be Noah. And it, they were supposed to write a calculator. And the first thing that the calculator printed out was, welcome to Noah's calculator. Except Noah's calculator, the first thing it printed out was, welcome to Carly's calculator. And in fact, they had a 90% code match with Carly's assignment. So um, it's hard to talk your way back from that, uh, just so you know. Um, so stories. Um, it is really common to have students swear they did not cheat, and then eventually, in presented, when presented with a bunch of evidence, they will eventually back off. I have to tell you, I talk to a lot of professors about this. Faculty often feel that the projected outrage of the students accused of cheating is inversely proportional to innocence. That is to say, the students who are like, my ancestors will get you. This is not fair. You are being discriminatory, blah, 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 everything in the world. Those are the students that the professors, well, let's put it this way. They're more likely to suspect you if you do that than if you say, wait, what are you saying? Can you explain to me what went on? Because I'm just not, I mean, it, sure, it's upsetting, but don't be outraged. Umbrage doesn't help you. And in fact, oh, the professor I was talking to about employing the student in their um, lab told me that he's, he t in, when he's teaching upper division classes and he sees students who are accused of cheating in their lower division classes, uh, the students who admitted it, said they would work on making it better, are doing great in their upper division classes. And they see a general trend that the students who were most outraged about it are the ones who were having most trouble in upper division work. 
Now that's anecdotal stories from individual professors, but it might be an interesting thing for you guys to look into. Um, and I, I was going to tell the story about I know uh, a student who is working in the faculty's lab, member's lab, but I got to that when Alan was talking. And now here, this is my last slide. So Auden and, and, um, and Alan, wake up, because we're going to have a question and answer session soon. But so how do you protect yourself? And I spent a lot of time talking to professors about this. How do you make sure that you don't get accused of cheating when you were doing everything you thought you were supposed to be doing? Number one, frequent git commits. I had the professor who's probably responsible for the most cheating incidents that Alan has ever seen um, tell me that if you had frequent git commits where it was clear that they could see what you were working on, they wouldn't even accuse you of cheating if you had 94% code in common. That the frequent git commits where we can see, it's not just every time you commit there's a whole new function that happens to work perfectly but that it's clear that you're working on things, and they can see the evidence of it. Uh, that's the, the number one way to protect yourself. When in doubt, cite, and that means at every level. You, have, you could have a comment on one method that said, I couldn't make this work, but Tracy helped me debug it. Um, just that protects you. If you cite, the worst thing that will happen is you'll get a zero on that assignment. If you don't cite, the worst thing that could happen could be you're kicked out of the University of California. I mean, if it's your third case and all that kind of stuff. Obviously, that's an extreme case, but still. Um, a lot, professors feel differently about this. This is the kind of thing you really need to check with your instructor about what's going on. Some instructors do pair programming. Some instructors don't give a crap if you cheat or not. Uh, but if you have someone who's paying attention and is going to be doing a lot of academic integrity, know what they want. And the ones I talked to said, don't share anything electronic, and even paper can be a problem. If you want to help with other, work with other people, get a whiteboard and discuss it on a whiteboard. And don't even like take a photo of the whiteboard. Discuss ideas with other people. Don't have anything that you could turn into common code. Um, and then be careful how you ask for help. For example, the example that I was given today is, Sure, go up to someone else and say, man, I'm really having trouble making Scanf work for me. Um, it, for those of you who program in C, you know Scanf can, has a bewildering number of options, input options. I'm having trouble making Scanf work. Can you help me with a good help page about Scanf? Is completely different than how do I use Scanf to parse this tree? Because the how do I use Scanf to parse this tree is going to basically lead to someone essentially transferring a procedure to you that is essentially code. It may be high-level code, but it's code. Um, some professors say, don't even share pseudocode. And some professors say, it's OK with me if you share high-level pseudocode, but that's a very gray area. When is high, when is low. Um, when in doubt, talk to your instructor. Honestly, that's the most important thing. And um, that's the end of what I have to talk about. And now I am uh, delighted to see if anybody has any questions. Come on up, Alan and Auden. Go. Did, did it, I, I spoke up when Alan was talking, but did either of you have any, have any questions when you looked at mine? Presentation? I, I, like, I, I like citation. I like to think of citation as the core of academic integrity. So what academic integrity is about when you're a researcher is, oh, what, you, what academic integrity means when you're a researcher is you lay out for your readers the process by which you came to your ideas so that they can repeat it, right? Is, is an experiment repeatable in the sciences? Um, is a thinking process in the humanities repeatable? Well, these were my sources, right? And I cite what my sources are. So, so citation is uh, the most important thing that we do in academia. It's the thing that we do to say to others, I got my ideas, I got my suggestions from these other people. We're giving them credit, but we're also allowing others to follow in our footsteps. It's an act of generosity in two different kinds of ways, and that's one of the reasons why 
for many academics. It feels like the glue that holds us all together, right? It's a commitment that we have to each other that this enterprise of learning is a shared enterprise. So I, I really think of citation as, as the most important thing. So as, as Trace is saying, when you're in, in, in code, you know, cite. I got help debugging. And so I have an aside to that, and this isn't, I, get, I still have this one. Um, I have an aside to that, and that is in my long programming career, I have worked with some very big names. And I have to tell you, it is completely clear to me that the, the very best, most lauded people that I know in the field are the most eager and happy to give credit to other people. And when you give credit to other people, you are not making yourself look bad. It's really important that you know that. Right, and, and it's a form of transparency to the professor so that you're saying, I got my, my assistance here, I got my ideas here, and you're laying everything out for them. That's, that's again why it's a good thing to protect you. Well, no, I agree with everything you said. I don't have any questions. That's what I think of I have a question. So, oftentimes there's a lot of solutions online. We bring up Chegg, Stack Overflow. You can go on Rosetta Code and find the solution to almost any algorithm online. How do you think students can protect themselves from cheating when the answers are online, are accessible, and maybe even, in some cases, reviewing a similar example is essential to learning? How do we prevent students from cheating in this world? Well, to begin with, citation. Because, in fact, one of the professors I talked to today about this said that they ended up having this huge graph where most of the class had code in common, and they found out it was code from Corman, Lyserson, and Rivest, which to the engineering people, is, it's the textbook that's usually used in CS 101. So if, if one student is talking to the other students and say, well, they, the quicksort in Corman, Lyserson, and Rivest is very implementable, and then everybody uses that quicksort. As long as they say, I got this out of Corman, Lyserson, and Rivest, the worst thing that can happen, and that's only if the instructor said, and by the way, don't use textbooks, um, is that you get a lower grade. Y you have to realize what instructors want is for you to show that you've learned enough of this material that you can move on and do well in the follow-on class that assumes that you know this stuff. In engineering, the classes that you're being asked to take, with some exception, are, you're being asked to take them because you're going to need them to excel in the next class. For example, the class I've been teaching for the last two years, CE16, if you don't know how to do proofs by induction, you're going to do incredibly poorly when you try to learn about analysis of algorithms. I mean, it just isn't going to work well. And, um, and so if you cheat and make it look like you understand um, proofs by induction, then you are going to be a frustration to your fellow students, your professor, and yourself when you go on to CS 101. I, I think of it, as, just to add quickly, I think of it as the difference between... Uh, now it's on. <laughs> I think of it as the difference between orienting yourself toward the answer versus orienting yourself to the process. Um, and uh, I, I know particularly when we have grades that are uh, you know, a lot of the grade has to do with whether you got to the right answer. The, the temptation is to get to that right answer or code that's not working. It's not working. It's not working. What am I doing wrong in here? The debugging process is just the most frustrating thing at times, unless you're a coder and then you love that stuff. <laughs> um, we love it when it works. Right. Um, and you're like, I just, you know, if I get the answer, I'll, I'll figure out how to make it work. Right. But, uh, but that's, the, the mindset is, it's the effort. You know, it's that whole, it's the journey, not the destination kind of thing. It's the effort that is the thing that the professor is looking for. That's what you want to be able to remember, I think. And there was a question yeah. back there. You can. Yeah, what if uh, you're just like too lazy to figure out how ScanF works, but it's like not the main part of the assignment, and like the actual assignment took like four hours to do, and you just go on Stack Overflow to find out how to read a file? Is that still cheating? Um, you know, I hate the idea of answering for other professors, but it certainly doesn't sound egregious to me. If, um, if you're using your scanf to parse your tree, it's not a tiny part of your code, right? I mean, your assignment is probably how you parse trees. And so if, you're, if, you're, if someone has helped you 
produce basically a method that is doing your entire assignment. That's a different thing than I'm really computing this amazing thing and I just want to get the out, I just want to read the input with Scanf. Um, and it, the truth is that every computer programmer in the world is very familiar with man pages and looking at other examples and things like that. And as long as you've gone down low and you're looking about how to use a library routine or whatever, I can't imagine anyone ever, ever giving you crap about it. On the other hand, it's always a great idea to put in your README. And I learned how to use Scanif by reading Stack Overflow. And with even a URL in there. Z, will you pass the mic to Z? Thank you. Uh, something I noticed um, was that even though faculty and students may agree on sort of a similar what is uh, cheating, um, there's all those cases where it's like 50-50 on whether faculty thought it was cheating or not. Do you think there's work that can be done maybe to get more consistency on the grading side towards what falls under the cheating and what does not? We've discussed having a, a divisional policy on what constitutes cheating. The thing is, any policy we could come up with would not work for some instructors. And um, for example, there are some professors who don't check cheating. They think the provosts hate them. Um, I'm not even joking. Um, they um, say it, they're not paid enough. Maybe they're lecturers and they don't get paid for the interim and an awful lot of the cheating processing happens in between quor quarters as opposed to during the quarter. Uh, and so they're just letting it go. You don't pay me enough to go through this pain. Um, and if they think it is part of their academic freedom to not check for cheating, why should I care? They're only screwing themselves. If I put this amazing amount of effort into my class and they don't even want to take it seriously, they're not hurting me, they're hurting themselves. Uh, so they don't want to be forced to even check for cheating. And then there are other people who think pair programming is the way to go and is very inclusive and besides that programming is, is uh, collaborative. And so I want the chance to have all my students work on their projects in pairs. And then there are other professors who feel very strongly that if you're going to be writing the code for an airplane or a pacemaker or a bridge that could actually kill people if they um, malfunction, you need to be able to show that you've mastered the material on your own and they're offended at the idea that you would accept pair programming. And I think it is possible, and maybe Auden and Alan can help me think about this, but I think it is possible we could come up with some very basic, low level, this is what you need. And the main thing I've been trying to get across to my professors, and I think I'm mostly succeeding, is whatever your rules are, you have to make sure they're clearly spelled out in your syllabus. This is just a well, kind of boring idea. I wouldn't call it wild, but uh, and sort of a hybrid solution would be to have some kind of template for a policy on on what constitutes cheating or plagiarism in any given class, and then a given instructor can check the boxes for you know for what constitutes cheating in that class. So that students have sort of a general template of concepts like collaboration. And, uh, citations and so forth uh, to refer to, and then they would have a, a standardized place to look for, or a standard format to look at for what constitutes uh, cheating in that class. I think that's a great idea. I'm not sure if we could make it work, but it's certainly a good idea. One thing some professors do, some of you in the room have probably had professors who do this, is your assignment number one is you have to prove you can use Git by checking in a signed sheet that says that you have read our academic policy and you intend to follow it. Um, and one of the professors I talked to today said that he, when, once he sees the recordings of this meeting, that he might consider saying your assignment one is you have to sign this thing saying you watched the presentation on cheating um, so that they're sure that you know at least as much as we're talking about in this room. Anything else that, uh, any other questions? Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you all for your presentation. Um, one thing I was curious about is, uh, one thing that came up when we were talking to students is that a lot of people feel like in the real world, they're gonna be doing things like collaborating. They're kind of thinking that their experience as an academic should 
reflect their like what they're going to be doing vocationally. So do you think that it would be helpful or do you think it's like a valid claim for students to want to be able to do things that they'll do later on their jobs? And do you think classes could be or should be restructured in that way? Uh, um, well, I have a lot of answers to that. Among the answers that I have are that I have I have spent a, about 10 years working in the industry. And it really sucks when you're working in a group and it turns out that everybody's waiting for you to finish so they can say, hey, we are done. Uh, and if you have someone who hasn't mastered the material well enough to do at least a shoddy version of the assignment, then I don't want to I don't want to collaborate with them anyway. Um, honestly, when you've been programming for a long time, one of the collaborators you get is yourself. And one of the most humbling things in the world as a programmer is to look at your ten year old code, as and it it feels like someone else wrote it, and it can it. It costs industry a lot of money. When you look at code that almost solves a problem you have and you say, oh, this is garbage, and you throw it out, and now someone writes brand new code. That's a waste of money if that code really was almost what you have, uh, what you need. And that kind of thing happens much more often when you have low quality programmers. So I would say that the being able to produce code by yourself is actually a necessity for being able to collaborate well in the future. No one enjoys collaborating with people who don't know what they're doing. Um, if you are amused by that kind of thing, um, feel free to read some of the subreddits I enjoy, uh, such as Choosing Beggars and uh, I Don't Work Here Lady and um, uh, Tales from Tech Support. They have lots and lots of stories about people who are trying to pretend they understand stuff and are really just being menaces in the workplace. So I think they're slightly different situations. And I really like, for example, in some of our classes in engineering, you collaborate with other people and you write collaborative code, but you have to change your partner each time. And for example, in Gabe Elkheim's mechatronics class, the first half of the course, you switch who you're partnering with each time. And when you turn it in, you don't, all, don't just turn it in. You also evaluate your partner's performance in the class. And then for your final project, Gabe chooses what group you're in. So, and he has reasons for that. So there's a lot of collaboration. You get a lot of practice collaborating. But it's not completely in the wild uh, collaboration. It's structured around uh, educational needs. And pair programming, for example, really serious pair programming, um, there's rules about when you switch who's running the keyboard and, and even how you stand or sit near each other and how you work together. So it's pair programming, but it, it's been set up with actual research behind it on how can you ensure that one person isn't just taking ownership of the project and the other person is going, well, uh, yeah, sure, that's what I would have done if you'd let me. I, I think. Yeah, get Max's. Hello. Oh, you figured it out. <laughs> You're supposed to be in the humanities. Now you get both, both mics. Uh, OK, I'll, I'll, I'll choose this one. Okay. OK, yeah, I just wanted to respond. I think that's a good example. I, I love that you brought that up, Max. And, and uh, I think it's a good example of how maybe our research can, can create some, some, um, an opportunity for dialogue where, where uh, instructors can engage with students and explain you know, why do we impose these restrictions. And there are, because there is, I mean, in, in many fields, there are reasons for creating learning environments that are more restricted than the thing you encounter later in life. And there's a passage in, in Star Wars where Luke is like blindfolded, I think. And he doesn't just like throw off the blindfold and say, why do I need to do this? I'm not going to be fighting blindfolded, right? But it's a practice. Same thing in statistics. When I teach statistics, I force the students to do things by hand or calculate sums of squares by hand or at least using a calculator when, you know, when I personally, I do it in R or other people might use it in SPSS, so doing it by software. But the practice of doing this thing that you might not ever do again in, in the case of, of doing sums of squares by hand is still useful for helping you understand the problem and solve problems in the future. But I think it's a great discussion to have and it's important for students to, be, to, to have that be explained to them. And, and I like both these answers and I'll add one more. And that is that um, 
oftentimes, I, I don't know if uh, students realize how hard true collaboration is, right? So you might think that you're collaborating with each other because you're all sitting down together. Um, but the concern that uh, I think is, is behind some of the stuff that, uh, that Tracy was saying in particular is that um, everybody wants to know that you're really learning it. Sometimes you're working in a group and somebody else is learning it and you're in that moment where like, I'm not really following it, but here we are with the answer, right? So true collaboration is actually also a hard skill, and that's one of the reasons that we have a general education requirement called collaborative endeavor, uh, where in those classes you're supposed to learn how, what collaboration is actually like. So you might think that you're in a collaborative, collaborative uh, mode, and this is how industry does it, but you might not be actually in a collaborative mode in which you're uh, you know, um, actually learning. I, I like to tell uh, how in uh, high school, in physics classes, all the classes that I had, you know, we do labs and you'd have a partner. And I always had control freak partners. Here, Alan, you measure the string. And then they would do everything else, right? <laughs> and that's not why I'm not in the sciences anymore. I like to read the sciences. Calculus was my, my glass ceiling. Um, but I remember that, right? And those were supposed to be collaborative moments, and it turns out they weren't <laughs> at all. And so that's one of the things that I worry about. When, when, if students are working together, you know, um, if they know what good collaborative practice is, then it's a great learning moment, right? And there are lots of reasons to do that kind of thing. But for the reasons that Auden said as well, I think there are times when learning really works well when you put yourself into some pretty tight restrictions. And as Tracy says, um, you really want your collaborators to all have um, some, the collaboration is much better when, when everybody's at a skill level um, where they could manage it on their own. You know, that said, helping other people is really good for you. I That's mean, true. the secret weapon to learning well if you're having trouble with a topic, in my opinion, is to either really teach someone else or pretend to teach someone else. I talk to people about rubber duck debugging or just trying to find a friend who will let you rant at them about what you learned in class today all the time. But you can do that at a level that does not amount to coding together. Yeah, you could teach me how to do your assignment, you know, and I may not understand you, but in the course of trying to make me understand you, there's a good chance that you will understand some things that you weren't understanding as he's well. He's being overly modest. Thought. I've talked to Alan about programming problems before, and he's actually pretty damn good at computational thinking. So my dad was a programmer. Don't you love the way he said that? Programmer. <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer. Yes. Hello. So I, I think I might be the only advisory counselory person in the room. So I'm going to bring up the advisory counselory points of view, um, which typically talk about the elephant in the room. And so what I'm concerned about is bias, and I'm concerned about stereotype threat, and uh, many of our students' feelings of anxiety about even belonging in the classroom in the first place. And so one of the things that I haven't heard talked about here is what is the approach that is um, taught to or faculty is instructed in or uh, encouraged to take in the way of uh, innocent until proven guilty or hey, we're really glad you're here, but here's what we're noticing and this is something that we need to talk about as opposed to you cheated, sign this, right? How, how can we... How can we approach that problem? I think that's a really great question, Jennifer. And I will tell you the truth. We have piss poor training of teachers on this campus. Um, Siddle is trying to change that. And um, they spend a lot of time talking about um, how to be inclusive and what, how, can you, how can you make sure your students are learning without having to be a cop is one of the things that I've heard Jody say a lot of times, Jody Green, the CITL director uh, and associate vice provost for student success. And um, we can do a better job talking to professors about that. And I think there are a lot of professors who are, who are learning a lot about that. Um, I personally think it's exceedingly appropriate to explicitly address stereotype threat in the classroom and talk about stereotype threat and how you fight it and what a growth mindset is um, and all that stuff. Um, so 
that's, that's my own approach. Um, and I'll see, I haven't taught a programming class in 15 years. Next winter, I'll be teaching programming again, and I'll see if my ideas on that transfer to a programming class rather than a math class. Important question, especially because uh, so psychologists uh, have, have, have shown that these kinds of, of biases show up, especially in, in, in ambiguous situations. And in fact, Carmel here is, is doing her senior thesis uh, precisely on on the uh, role of, of bias uh, in uh, judgments about whether something constitutes plagiarism. Um, so uh, it's an it's an important uh, question to 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 ask, especially when we get into cases of of, of an evidence that isn't so clear cut. Yeah, I want to thank you for bringing that up uh, because it, my my experience in being provost is is that everybody has a lot to learn about all of this, right? And and the, absolutely one of the reasons that I've gotten really involved in rethinking how we handle academic uh, integrity on, on the campus is talking with students about their experiences in the classroom, uh, talking with faculty about their experiences in the classroom, and, and as a faculty member who never got, you know, no faculty member gets trained in how to deal with academic integrity. No, none of us did. Well, maybe you did. That's your, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. Right, and so that's one of the things is we're thinking about how to train students about this. We're also working on, you know, and, and I've been engaged more and more with graduate students, you know, who are also, um, they're not getting trained, but they're being put in, in positions of responsibility for this. And so it's like, okay, let's talk about what you're having to deal with here. And, and I try to walk them through what I think is a good process in all of this. Um, but it's, it's really important to raise that because um, it's one of the, the, the really important pieces of work that faculty need to do. And as you say, for the students who are at risk of that stuff, to be able to recognize when that's happening and be able to respond to it in a way that, A, is not gonna put people back in this defensive mode, but you know, actually be able to you know, um, change behavior. So I think it's huge. Unfortunately, I would like to end us on time so that I don't even know if they're still videotaping because we're past our time limit. Um, so I would like to thank my co-presenters and you guys for showing up. And the reason we videotaped it, please tell all your friends, we're going to make this available to students who didn't even um, participate in the discussion today. And we're hoping that this will help with our desire to have better communication, which both you'll note in, in Auden's uh, re results, both faculty and students, although faculty even more than students, thought that one of the things we needed to do was to better communicate our standards to students. And so this meeting and the videotaping of this meeting is one of our efforts to try to help with that. So thanks a lot. Thank you, everybody.